So uh, let's get going. Thank you all for your time today. What we're going to do is we're going to review Portfolio Builder, uh, the four different approaches that you can take. You know that there are videos on this, but also uh, how to integrate that with VisionWorks and then throw it open so we can entertain um, any questions that, uh, that you might have. So the first thing I'm actually going to do is open uh, VisionWorks and I'm just going to go to a portfolio and current holdings. So one of the things about Portfolio Builder is it's really designed to build uh, model portfolios. So a client comes to you and the client has whatever the client has. And so the whole point of current holdings is what does that client have right now? And that's as compared to going to solutions in the allocation tab where we can talk about reallocating a client's portfolio into something that we want to recommend. And that's really where we are more likely to tie in a portfolio builder because that's where we can use one of the model portfolios that we set up. So going back to entries and then talking about uh, current holdings, it's going to be entirely up to you to what degree you try and replicate the client's current holdings. My personal view is that your recommendation is going to be more one of you know, moving forward and doing, uh, you know, doing something different so that I would be much more inclined personally to uh, have the, just use the basic tab and then what you'd be able to do is select current holdings. So I just want you to notice this. Um, current holdings enables this portfolio holdings button so that you can put in what the client has right now. Whereas if you open the list and select a portfolio, these are the model portfolios that you put in in Portfolio Builder. And when you select those, the current holdings portfolio holdings button is disabled. So if we go to SMAs, we don't have um, a, a current holdings type button. SMAs are separately managed accounts from you know, portfolio managers. But if we went to detailed, we'd have the current holdings button and the portfolio holdings button in enabled so we could put in specific holdings. So just keeping in mind that all we want to do with what does the client have now is just capture where they are um, and going into a lot of detail, modeling their specific holdings, considering that we may want to make you know, some fairly wholesale changes, uh, I think would be uh, just a, frankly a waste of time. What I think you can do uh, much more effectively is just to go into current holdings go to portfolio holdings and then replicate, you know, roughly the kinds of returns that uh, it would appear that the client has been earning. So I, I, that would be my preferred way of doing things. Again, you know, up to you, how do you want to do it? So let's go to um, portfolio builder and we'll go through the different approaches that you can take. Uh, hopefully by this point, you're fairly familiar with them, but, um, there may be the odd thing that comes up. So basic portfolios are not at all concerned with um, the uh, specific holdings. They're only concerned with rates of return. So for example, some of our clients might be CPAs. They're not involved in recommending specific portfolios, but they do want to be able to roughly replicate, you know, are you a conservative investor, balanced investor, aggressive investor? So in that case, all you need to do is add a portfolio, give it any name you want, and then put in whatever rate of return you want to uh, assume for that portfolio. Uh, as we'll discuss a little later when we go to asset allocation, when it comes to return assumptions for asset classes, you can use the FP Canada return assumptions. Uh, they have started providing return assumptions over the last couple of years. What FP Canada did before that was they actually provided model portfolios with return assumptions. 
So we still use those. The return assumptions haven't really changed appreciably. Uh, if you want to create a new uh, portfolio, I, all you have to do is click the add button, you know, put in the name, put in the rates of return. Or if you have an existing one, you can click edit, edit the rates of return and uh, so on. Uh, the other thing I just want to point out about these, because you may not be aware of it, is that there is a capital gains growth rate. But if you select applied capital gain rate over time and click this button, you can actually change that rate over time. So if you're concerned about a market correction, you could go in and actually enter a negative return this year or next year, for example, and then be able to bring that in uh, on that allocation tab in VisionWorks in order to see what the long-term impact of, of that might be. So again, uh, basic portfolios, pretty straightforward, just rates of return, uh, you know, just the, the attempt to roughly uh, approximate uh, uh, the return. So I have a question being asked. Um, sorry, I don't see a- It's, it's me, Michael. Oh, it's I see. Grant. Okay, yeah, Grant, go ahead. Um, what's the difference in terms of the software between that capital gains growth and the turnover rate? Oh, this is very important. Capital gains growth is the long-term growth rate that you want to apply, but the turnover rate is how often is this portfolio turned over? How often are those gains realized, uh, at, which then come into taxable income? So just let's make my math really easy. If you've got a capital gains growth rate of 5% and you've got a $100,000 portfolio, then it grows from 100 to 105,000. But if you have a turnover rate of 20%, what you're saying is 20% of the 5%, 1% of that portfolio is turning over every year, gains are being realized and are being taxed. So yes, the portfolio goes from 100 to 105, but the tax return then would show uh, a $1,000 capital gain, you know, $500 taxable gain. So turnover rate, how often is the portfolio being turned over and therefore uh, what kind of taxes are resulting? Is that clear? That, that's great, thank you. And then on the dividends, um, the, the one that's indicated just as dividend return as opposed to foreign, that's gonna use the, uh, uh, dividend tax credit on that? Dividend component. return will use the dividend tax credit for eligible dividends. Foreign dividends, US, uh, because they're not Canadian companies, the dividends from them are actually taxed as interest. So you don't get the, the dividend tax credit on a foreign yeah. dividend. Yeah. No, that's great. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Okay. So let's go to SMAs. SMAs are separately managed accounts where you're turning the money management over to a, a portfolio manager and you can add any number of, of portfolio managers. We included Forstrong as an example. You know, we always like to use examples so you can kind of follow along. And Forstrong offers uh, several different separately managed accounts. So the way these work, and I'm just gonna click the edit button here is that I can go in and notice, uh, you can put in, in, you know, if you're doing an ad, uh, you can put in the name. And then what you can do is you can add the asset class weighting. So if we click the add button, what you'll see over here are the different SMA asset classes that we've included, but you can add your own. So I could click the button, uh, you know, go to the color palette, put in some color chip, whatever it might be, call that whatever I wanted to call it. And then I can use these up and down arrows to reposition things just so that they're, you know, in some logical order in my mind. So, you know, if you had, um, I don't know, high yield bonds, you could then add high yield bonds and then move them up into the high yield bond position. So the idea here is that with a portfolio manager, the portfolio manager is going to give you some breakdown of how a particular portfolio is uh, invested. So what you're going to do using these asset classes, 
having edited them if you need to, is then just drag and drop them over. And given that portfolio that they, that they uh, provide details for, you're just going to enter you know, the weightings of the portfolio in the different asset classes. There is no direct connection between an asset class and a rate of return for the asset class and the return assumptions for the portfolio. What you should also be able to get from a portfolio manager is their return assumptions for that portfolio overall. So you're just going to put in the distribution of the asset classes, and then you're going to look at those return assumptions and then just type them in. Again, not a function of a general return assumption times a weighting, but merely type in what those return assumptions are. So as you can see, we could open up uh, you know, these different uh, SMAs that Forstrong offers, for example. And then if I click at it, you can see the different weightings and you can see the different uh, return assumptions. So any questions about SMAs? Okay, so let's go to asset allocation and we'll talk about the two tabs here. One is library and what library says is we've put in as a, a way of, um, you know, sort of illustrating things, we've put in seven model portfolios uh, and then three custom ones which are open for you to go and play with. And we've done that both for uh, regular um, uh, investments and also for seg funds. So if I select as an example, the growth portfolio, um, then you can see the different return assumptions here and the different weightings. Uh, and notice that they're taking the conventional uh, portfolio allocation approach, which is you know equities, fixed income and so on. But I can click edit and then I can go in and change the name. I could deselect active, by the way, if I didn't want to show those seven, um, but I can change the name and then I can change the weightings of the portfolios in the different asset classes. And the way this works is that you would go in and you would put in an asset class, let's say short-term fixed, 20% overall in the portfolio, but of that 20%, you need to put in 100% of how the subclasses are distributed. So I've used 25% under one year, 75% one to five years. That's my 100% of my 20. Or if I go down to equities, you can see it's some uh, distribution between preferred shares and common shares. I could make all of these asset classes zero. And what I could do is go in and put it in as a 100% mutual fund portfolio. Now, of course, I'm gonna get a little red thing here saying, you know, you can't have 200%, but I'll put in, sorry, I'll put in 100% all, all mutual funds. And then what would happen is I would come down here and for the different mutual funds, I would be putting in you know, how much of the different classifications of funds uh, would go into the mutual fund. So again, you can see I've got um, the uh, balance fund being, a, a hundred, I've got a, a, an alternative strategy in here, but I've got the balance fund being 100% of that 100%. So again, the upper level is always um, the overall allocation and then the lower level is the breakdown to, um, to add up to that total overall allocation. So let me go in and uh, get rid of this. And we're back to our 100%. Um, the other part of this then are the return assumptions that we want to use and the uh, default assumptions that are being used are long term rates. And you can see if we look at, you know, long term fixed income rates, they've been actually coming down quite noticeably 
but nevertheless, they're much higher than, you know, generally is attainable in the real world. Um, and I want you to notice, for example, equities. You can see here the U.S. long-term rate, 11%. Now, what we've done is we've also provided the FP Canada uh, return assumptions, and they're in a separate file, which you should have on your computer. And in order to switch to the FP Canada return assumptions, you would click the load from file button, find that FP Canada set of return assumptions, and then open it up. And now you'll see that the long-term return assumptions are replaced by the FP Canada ones. Uh, Grant, go ahead. Uh, I, I see you have a dividend growth rate assumption on this yes. tab. Yeah. It, is a dividend growth rate assumption something that you can apply on the basic tab as well? No, we haven't. The basic is just meant to be what what kind of um, uh, return assumption do we want to use? Very, you know, very rough. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, so this then is a little different. Remember with SMAs, I said, you're just putting in the asset allocation, whatever the portfolio manager offers. And then what you're doing is you're just putting in the weighted return or the return uh, of the portfolio in the different categories. Again, just in general provided by the uh, portfolio manager. But here it's, it's different because what's going to happen is we're using the return assumptions in the different categories and then depending on the weighting of the portfolio, what ends up happening then is it's the weighting for the categories, uh, or sorry, the return assumptions for the categories times the weighting for the categories that's used then to figure out the overall return assumptions for the portfolio. So uh, again, you, know, you can uh, put in your overall return assumptions and then you can also change those portfolio return assumptions if you wish. Let's go to detail. Detailed are specific holdings. Uh, so I'm just going to create a portfolio and I'm going to call it uh, Michael's Balanced. And to add to this portfolio, I can add short-term fixed income instruments, equities, mutual funds, ETFs, et cetera. So today we'll use mutual funds and I'm going to click the add button. And I want you to notice that there are a whole lot of different uh, funds already entered here. Um, what you'll see is that the overall fund uh, subclasses are the major subclasses that are offered by the Canadian Investment Fund Standards Committee. And then all mutual funds are then uh, placed into one of those major categories. So if you wish to add a fund uh, to any group, sorry, I was doing a demo earlier, I had that in. All you have to do is select the category, click the add button, it inserts a black blank line, then you just type in the mutual fund code, hit the enter key, and then that does a lookup for a database that will put in that specific fund and then those return assumptions. Um, what's behind this, the last time I checked, I haven't actually done a tally recently, is uh, about 57,000 regular mutual funds, SEG funds and ETFs. And we buy that data from a company called Fund Data and then we update it quarterly. The return assumptions are based on an, our annual return assumptions. And we can't, and this is important to understand, we cannot technically provide return assumptions for each of the mutual funds, actual return assumptions. Uh, what fund data does is it provides us with the fund codes and, uh, and so on. Uh, but not the return assumptions. What we do for the return assumptions is we use uh, Morningstar and we go into the different categories and their subcategories. There are 50 some odd subcategories. And we have a database that we use which takes the top 25% performance-wise 
of all funds in one of those 50 odd subcategories. And then we use that to um, figure out the average return for the top 25% of funds in that uh, subcategory, that uh, one of the 50 subcategories. And then we apply those returns. We can provide the actual standard deviation and MER for a particular fund. We get that from fund data, but we can't provide the returns because you know, that's uh, proprietary data that Morningstar has and we simply don't have a license to do, do that. So this would be the average of the top 25% of funds in the particular subcategory. That said, if you wish, you can go in and you can edit the returns. And I don't think often it'll be the interest dividend or capital gains returns. It will be most likely the NAV return. So just to explain that, if a fund's overall return, let's just say is 10%, the fund of course being a trust must pay out the interest dividends and realized capital gains. So that's what you have in those columns. But the balance of the return, the degree to which the mutual fund increased in value due to unrealized gains is an increase in its net asset value. So you can look at the overall return of a fund, a specific fund, uh, do the math for you know, the interest dividend and capital gains returns, the realized returns that are paid out each year, and then you can edit the, the NAV column. And you can see, I actually had imported this from one of our client's holdings. And the reason for the yellow in the background is that she had edited those return, those NAV return assumptions to reflect the total return that the, uh, that the funds had actually earned. So once we've got this group of funds set up, then what we're able to do is we're able to go in and start constructing portfolios based on uh, adding the funds to uh, our uh, Michael's balance portfolio and then putting in the weighting of the funds within that balance portfolio. So I'm just gonna make this 50-50. And then what we'll have is we'll have that balance portfolio made up of these two funds uh, with of course the weighted return based on the return assumptions for those funds and then we'll be able to import that into uh, VisionWorks. So I have no doubt that we may have some questions here. So if so, please unmute yourself and just speak up. Um, is there any way to input specific individual securities? Yes, absolutely. So notice what we're doing here is we're selecting yeah. the asset class. So what we wanna do now is we want to select equities and we want to click the add button. And then it's the same thing. We can add equities to the list. Now, that said, we do not have a, you know, you can't just click the add button and type in uh, a, a, you know, a stock exchange symbol. We don't have that in the background like we do with the mutual funds because that's proprietary data to the stock exchanges. And it's very, it would be very expensive for us to acquire that. So you would have to do a lookup in Morningstar and then add the stocks that you want to use and use the Morningstar data for them. Okay. So it just becomes much more manual process. It's manual, but once you, you know, most of the time, maybe you're going to use, I don't know what you're going to use, 10 stocks, 20 stocks, portfolios are going to have different mixes of them depending on the client. But once you've got them in, then, you know, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, yes, go ahead. Is there a way to import a portfolio into that section? No, because this is Portfolio Builder where we're setting up model portfolios. It's different if we're uh, importing a portfolio into VisionWorks itself. It depends on the back office system that you have. We'll get to that when we go back to VisionWorks, but we can import like a model portfolio from um, uh, Morningstar, for example. Okay, so we've got our little model portfolio here. And then you can see based on, on the, the portfolio uh, weightings of those different funds and the return assumptions for each of the funds, 
then we end up with a weighted return assumption uh, for the overall portfolio. And notice, by the way, that we can switch between um, uh, asset class geography and if we had entered it, uh, sectors. There is the ability to enter sectors for the, uh, the different holdings. Any other questions? So one other thing that I want to point out is for each of these tabs, what you'll see, and we used it uh, for the asset allocation return assumption, in the bottom right corner, there's a save to file and load to file button. So each of these portfolios has a different structure to its database. You know, the basic is just rates of return. So if I do a save to file, I would be saving that file with a VSB, uh, B for basic database. If I were to save a, an SMA file, it would be saved with a VSSM uh, file extension for you know, separately managed and so on. So you can save these files. And then what you can do is you can send those files uh, to a different computer, either as an email attachment, or maybe you've got a central server, you could post them on the server, et cetera. And then what you're able to do is you're able to go to load from file, go locate a particular file, and then load it in. So uh, you only need to set these portfolios up in one place, and then they can be shared amongst all the different computers that you know, you might be using or other advisors and so on. So that makes it fairly easy to um, transport them around. So any questions about Portfolio Builder? So let's go back to VisionWorks and then we'll just start to um, apply this. So again, my view is current holdings represent what do you have now, not you know, uh, where am I going to be or what kind of reallocation am I going to suggest and so on. And the reason, of course, is that when we talk about uh, building plans, what I always will encourage you to do is to start off with whatever you want to call it. We call it initial vision. You could call it base case, whatever it might be, and to load into it the client's current financial circumstances, including how their portfolio is invested, and also the things that they are intending to have and do in life, you know, the path they're on now, whether it's the kitchen renovation they want to do, or the vacations they want to take, or the cars they want to buy, whatever it might be. And then once that's loaded, then to go in, create a new solution, and in that new solution, start to model changes. What if we did this? What if we did that? And those changes also will include things like tax tactics, you know, splitting pension income, reallocating portfolios, and so on. So initial vision or whatever you want to call that solution, this is uh, what you've got now. This is the path you're on. And then the new solution where we start to make changes. And of course, we can have multiple new solutions. So I've just created a solution that I call Portfolio Builder just to illustrate this. I'm going to go down to Solutions. And it's on the Allocation tab that really I want to be able to go in and start talking about reallocating portfolios over time. And again, I want to emphasize that what we do is what I call dynamic data. So you know the ability to change vacation expenses over time increase them once we retire, end them, uh, you know, at some age that makes sense to the client and so on. So you can see here, for example, that um, I do have a, a change from a, a current holding to a more conservative portfolio. Uh, I'm just actually going to click revert and I can revert all portfolios to what I have originally put in, in the uh, current holdings panel. And you can see I'm using just a, a very simple basic portfolio. So here we have a four list. So I can talk about different allocations in a non-reg versus a TFSA versus an RRSP. You know, maybe if I want to have an overall balanced approach, I want to put my fixed income securities more in the 
uh, registered plans in my capital gain securities in the non-reg portfolio. Again, you know, with interest rates being where they are today, that may not be uh, a wise rule of thumb anymore. Uh, but the point is I can select different portfolios and apply different allocations. And as a dynamic model, I can apply different allocations at different points in the client's life. So I'm very much a, a, a believer that if we're talking with a young client who's got 30 years until retirement, that looking at their tolerance for risk, if it's conservative, doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, you know, we have to be respectful of uh, regulatory authorities, but, you know, later in life, sure, be nice and conservative as you approach retirement, you know, be more balanced, take some risk off the table. But today, with, you know, many years ahead of you, you know, you can afford to be more growth oriented. So if we want to make a change over time, the point is that what we would do is we would click on a year to select that year this is the year when I want to make a change. And then what we do is we click a second time to go into edit mode. And when we're in edit mode, you can see the little edit button. And then that allows me to uh, click on it, bring up the four uh, types of portfolios. These all relate back to portfolio builder. And then I can select a particular uh, uh, style and then from there, I can go in and select a particular portfolio. Uh, this is probably not exactly taking risk off the table, but I want to illustrate how this links back to uh, portfolio builders. So now I can, I can select that portfolio, which in fact is a higher rate of return, and I can apply it just to the non-reg, or I can click the apply to all button and apply it to all portfolios and then I can see the uh, before and after change, which actually is not showing much. Um, so you have the ability then to change portfolio allocations at any point in the client's uh, life. So select once to select the year, select a second time to go into edit mode. And then when you're in edit mode, go in and apply a different portfolio allocation either to the individual portfolio or uh, to all portfolios. And you can see then the conservative is reducing the uh, returns that the client's earning. So questions about that? Michael, what do you, yes. what do you think is the best way to highlight the, the change that your solution has made versus the base case other than looking at this um, particular uh, chart live? Uh, you, you, you mean something like in the report itself? Yeah, I, I guess overall, um, I find we're become reasonably competent in using the software where I, I still have a ways to go is making it tell the story at the end, you know, that this is great when I'm in it, but I, I don't find that I'm going to invite the client in to look at these dynamic changes. And so is it, in your experience, is it, um, is it better to run a live session and have, have them look at changes or show them in a, a printed report? I, I think the former. So why don't we spend a minute talking about that? So let, before we go further with that, does anybody have any questions specifically about portfolio builder or integrating those portfolios into VisionWorks? There is one thing I want to add, by the way, but anybody with any questions? Okay, the quick ad that I want to make is very simple. If you have used the portfolios in portfolio builders, you know, TFSAs, non-reg portfolios, RSPs, the Smith plan, the Jones plan, et cetera, et cetera. If you wanna make a change, all you need to do is change the rate of return assumption. If you've got several mutual funds in a portfolio, change one of those uh, mutual funds in portfolio builder, you know, whatever change you wanna make, do that in portfolio builder. The next time you open a plan that uses 
that portfolio, the plan will automatically update to the changes you made in Portfolio Builder. So that makes um, you know, uh, updating uh, portfolios or changing allocations over time, if you're using Portfolio Builder, extremely efficient. Uh, we did have a question earlier, I apologize. If I go into current holdings uh, and go to detail, for example, in portfolio holdings, you can see that I can import portfolios from one boss, which is the Sterling Mutual Fund um, back office system, Univeris Wind Fund, or what's become you know, fairly popular index. Those are the, those are the um, back office systems that we're, um, that we're hooked up to. Uh, so that question had come up and I'd forgotten. So uh, let's go back to Grant's question. I am very much a belief. So let me back up. Planning ultimately is about learning and decision making. And I've uh, spoken about this many times. In the past, the learning medium was the written report. And it had to be the written report because way back when, Plans were built using spreadsheets, using tax software, you know, cobbling everything together, and it had to be uh, assembled into some nice presentable format so we could walk the client through, you know, all the different points, all the logic, all the recommendations. So the focus of attention then became the printed plan that we would sit down and review with clients. Well, I'm very much a believer that uh, planning in today's world should be much more collaborative or interactive. And I believe uh, that clients uh, lack perspective. So you can see if we go to real time mode that we want to be able to have a very simple conversation. You know, your net worth projection looks great. It includes your house, your cottage, your TFSAs, your RSPs, your income assets. TFSAs, RSPs, the assets that you'll live on in retirement, you know, remain positive throughout your life expectancy. By the way, we can switch from actual to today's dollars. You'll notice in the upper right corner. Uh, although this isn't, you know, the most robust income assets projection, it still uh, suffices. So I think once we've shown clients this, that they don't ask us, well, what about portfolio allocations? They ask us about, oh, that looks okay. Does that mean I could spend more on vacations? And then what we're able to do is we're able to go to cash flow, drill into vacation expenses and say, well, what do you have in mind? And then the client says, well, instead of 10 grand, what would happen if we spent 15 grand on the winter vacation? So, you know, we can make the appropriate adjustment, save it, close it, everything is updated, and then we're able to run our mouse over it and show the client the long-term impact. So you can see that actually leaves us with about zero, <laughs> uh, you know, close to retirement. But this allows us then to look at different things because typically clients will say, oh, well, if I did that, what would happen if I did something else? So we can go through and, and make all those changes with them. But what it also does is it allows us to do the portfolio um, reallocation. Now, if you go down to tactics um, and you go to the allocation tab, you can see, uh, actually, I don't even have a return being earned on the joint portfolio, but I could create, I could go to bill and um, the allocation tab, and then you can see the changes here. Well, it's exactly the same thing. I can show the client how we've assumed some different portfolio allocation and keeping in mind that there's also a compare function. What I'm able to do is I'm able to compare the current portfolio allocation with the new portfolio allocation. So I can pretty much walk clients through everything, you know, sort of explaining the differences, showing the comparison. Um, and then, you know, more importantly, I think, actually helping them answer their specific questions. What if we did this? What if we did that? Which I generally think will be, you know, home, lifestyle, family, career type of question. What if I gave my kid a hundred grand for a down payment on a house? What if I, you know, retired two years earlier? Those are the things that clients will ask, but we're also then able to go in and, you know, look at uh, things like portfolio reallocations and 
And literally we could make the ch that change on the fly live with the client if we wanted to. You know, I could go back and um, reassume the, the, I think it was the balance portfolio, was it? Yeah, I could reassume the balance portfolio and recalculate the output and then go back and have a look and see what kind of, you know, change that made. I just did that for the bait. I should have done it for all portfolios. He just, it, he doesn't have much in his non-reg. Should have done it here as well. Click, you know, apply to all down in the lower right. So um, that's my view, Grant, that, that, that planning is about learning and decision-making. We should be engaging the client in that process, their life, their money, their values, their personal preferences, which are attitudes uh, and so on. So our job is to help them understand, to learn, and then you know they'll make the decisions that they make. So that's just, that's my take on it. Well, that's great. Thanks, Michael. And just personally, I, I could, uh, you know, if you're thinking of what sessions to add to the, uh, the menu of, of sessions, this one, of using the the uh, the real time view and and the compare tricks and and best practices would be of high value to me for sure. Yeah, yeah, we are we are actually going to uh, we are actually going to do that because I think it's extremely um, important that and you know one of the things that's happened of course which is really favors doing this is over the last year how we're we are being forced to work more remotely with people so using webinar software bringing or webinar software bringing up you know illustration software whatever we're using um, has become much more commonplace and people are getting a lot more comfortable with it both us using it and clients you know having a, a virtual meeting so you know i, I just think it's um it, you know, it's, it's helped make this, you know, help, help its time arrive. Agreed. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, pleasure. Anybody else with any other questions? Okay, so what we've done over the last uh, few weeks is, you know, some of the basics. Um, what I'm going to do next week is I'm just going to go in and talk about retirement plans versus retirement and estate plans versus financial plans. You know, what are the differences? But in particular, I want to focus on retirement, uh, your understanding of retirement plans, retirement and estate plans versus financial plans and how cash flow is managed in the pre-retirement years. So that you're, you know, very clear on that and also, of course, uh, how the whole concept of the main bank account versus, you know, the non-reg portfolio, excess cash, withdrawals, and so on, how all of that works. So that's what we'll cover next week. And uh, we've been recording this. So uh, when we're done, I will post this on uh, YouTube so that you can go back and, and have a look at it.